there's trouble in paradise. Nations in the South Pacific are sick of us simply thinking of them as sunny playgrounds for postcard holidays. Many have significant problems which threaten their very existence. In the last few months, Scott Morrison has been trying to convince leaders around the Pacific that Australia is looking out for them and wants to help. But the Prime Minister isn't receiving much thanks in return. And that's because China is on the march and seems prepared to splash more of its cash in the region. How it's doing that, though, as we discovered, is alarming, at times sinister. Right now in the Pacific, seeing red has a lot of people seeing red. Two months ago, the Pacific nation of Kiribati switched its allegiance from Taiwan to communist China. So this is very clearly somebody tailing us. We're not being paranoid. No, this is actually very real. Now, as the first foreign journalists to try to report here since, we're under surveillance, then house arrest. My other instruction is to transfer you, only you, to a cell. Three and a half thousand kilometres west, in the Solomon Islands, a glimpse of how China might buy its alliances in the Pacific. So they rang you and said, we've got a million dollars for you if you come to the hotel and accept the switch to China. Yes. And just to the north, in war-torn Bougainville, with its legendary gold mine, we reveal a Chinese master plan. You would be quite happy to do business with China? Oh, yes. How do you describe China's actions in the Pacific? One word, expansionist. Captain Jim Fennell was the intelligence chief of the US Navy's Pacific Fleet, watching China's moves there on a daily basis. Now he's warning Pacific nations, swaying to China's influence, to beware. China has told all these Pacific countries that it just wants to be their partner. It wants to be involved economically. Do you not believe them? Well, we have evidence that shows that when they say they want to be your economic partner, the end result is they become your economic master. China demands no country in its diplomatic sphere can recognize Taiwan. And there's no doubt the communist superpower has a grand strategic plan in the Pacific extending its alliances further and further south. And with those alliances, massive infrastructure, like this gigantic wharf in Vanuatu that the country doesn't need, but could dock an aircraft carrier. With recent back-to-back -back recognition of China by the Solomon Islands and Kiribati, and possibly the soon-to-be independent Bougainville, we asked Jim Fennell to join us on a Pacific mission to report on China's intentions. They're interested in this area because it's essentially the lifeline or the, the, the choke point between America and Australia and New Zealand. China has built the Navy that people said they were never going to build. China has deployed their fleet to places they said they were never going to deploy. They believe that they're supposed to be the, the rightful leaders of this new global order. You know, the British century, the American century, now we're going to have the, the Chinese century. That's their vision. In September, Manasseh Sogavare, Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands, announced his country was ditching recognition of Taiwan. You've chosen to be on the right side of history. For communist China. A move Deputy Opposition Leader Peter Kenalira says was more a dash for cash than considered diplomacy. Are you happy that your country has switched allegiances from a democracy to a communist state? Uh, for me personally, I'm not. Uh, we should have taken our time and not be dictated uh, and marching to the beat of um, a more dominant country. It's really China first, and not Solomon's first. And here in the Solomons, we found direct evidence that China's influence could have a sinister side. So they rang you and said, we've got a million dollars for you if you come to the hotel and accept the switch to China. Yes. Daniel Sudani is the premier of the Solomon's largest island, Malaita. 
He says he was offered a million dollar bribe to back his country's switch to China. You're suggesting that there are a lot of corrupt politicians in your government? Yes. But a million dollars just to be pro-Chinese, uh, I mean, that's a hell of a way to do business. Oh, it is. It is a new way of doing things. It's really dangerous. You think there's one bag of money, there's got to be more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they don't come, you know, single. Weeks ahead of our visit, we requested an interview with the Solomons Prime Minister about his sudden recognition of China. While we're here, we try again in person. Also wanting to ask him about his refusal to investigate the bribery allegations made by Premier Sudani. As we're waiting, a high-level Chinese delegation leaves the Prime Minister's office. Then, hot on their heels, Manasseh Sogavare himself hurries out, head down and clearly in no mood to talk. Mr Prime Minister, 60 Minutes Australia, sir. We'd just like to ask you a couple of questions about China. Mr Prime Minister, Mr Prime Minister, can we ask you about the bribery money, please? Amid all the claims of bribery, corruption and kickbacks, it appears the Chinese have another novel approach to increasing their presence here, like leasing this entire island of Tulagi for the next 75 years. All 10 square kilometres of it, including the deep water port, oil and gas rights, fishing rights, forestry rights and tourism rights. The Chinese want all of it and the locals are not impressed. When I heard about it, I thought that um, China is a communist country and we, uh, the Solomon Islands is a democrat country. Margaret Manu is an unlikely enemy for China to make. But here on Tulagi, where land ownership is matrilineal, she's the voice of her people. And the people here didn't want to be owned by the Chinese. No. 60 Minutes has obtained a copy of the lease document, which is almost comical if it wasn't so sinister. The agreement was signed by Tulagi's provincial leader, who locals say hasn't been seen here since. And luckily for Margaret and her people, it was ruled unlawful when it became public. So there was no consultation? No, not at all. So the Chinese company just came in here and tried to have the agreement signed by one person, and that was it? That's what happened, without the people knowing what's going on. And what we're seeing now from our visits uh, to the islands here is that the Chinese are coming in with soft power and lots of cash uh, to buy out local officials to gain access to ports and airfields and resources uh, that give them a controlling monopoly in the islands and thus give them control over this vital sea lane. Coming up, not welcome in paradise. We're being followed by a government car. Why the government of Kiribati... There's something to do with the kinds of money that's being brought in. ...doesn't like nosy reporters. What's happening to us now is basically house arrest. That's next on 60 Minutes. There's something both threatening and absurd about being tailed by a mysterious black sedan in a country that essentially has only one road. It's mid-morning on our first day in Kiribati, the latest Pacific Island nation to recognize communist China and dump Taiwan. We're being followed by a government car. Now, whether that's Kiribati government or whether that's somebody from the government operating under Chinese instruction, who knows, but it's a very, very strange thing to happen in a place like this. With us is Captain Jim Fennell, former intelligence chief of the US Navy's Pacific Fleet, and someone who's witnessed firsthand how China does business in the Pacific. It could be that uh, the Chinese have said, as part of this deal, you're gonna have to pay more strict attention to who's here and what they're doing. Few foreign journalists come here, none since the country's abrupt switch of allegiance to China. One reason is that Kiribati requires a draconian film permit that journalists working in the region say is almost never granted. And 
gives the government the right to completely censor any news reports. We know we may meet trouble, but have come anyway. A move we'll soon find is supported by very senior figures in Kiribati. What's happening to us now is basically house arrest. On arrival at our hotel, we're immediately placed under house arrest and threatened with imprisonment. If you keep arguing with me, I'm not my other instruction is to transfer you to a cell. We have no right in the country. The sensitivities are running high here because Kiribati is critically important to China's Pacific Master Plan. The immense swathe of ocean territory controlled by this tiny island nation is smack in the middle of a secure sea lane China wants to establish, all the way to the Antarctic, which it calls the Blue Economic Passage. So you think this Blue Economic Passage, as China puts it, is, is just the cover story, is just the start of what they want to do? It's the start of a comprehensive plan that they have to dominate the region. And at first it's with economic development, but it will be followed by fishing fleets and maritime law enforcement, and then eventually naval forces. Back at our hotel, two very high level visitors have demanded access to us, despite the government agents guarding the entrance. These guys have told us if we do anything, they've made it quite clear today that if we leave the front door of this hotel, we'll be put into a cell. But who, whose order is that? I take it as the president. The man on the right is Kiribati's founding father and first president, Sir Eremia Tabai, one of the most respected men in the South Pacific. With him is Kiribati's opposition leader, Tisabu Tabani. In this interview, secretly filmed with their permission, these senior figures told us we were right to come here without a permit, also telling us there's media repression in their country, which has become more hardline since the current government's recognition of China. I'm not surprised, you know, uh, this is the action of, you know, a communist country, you know, uh, taking us round, you know. Sir Eremia and Mr. Tabani also told us the Chinese doled out $250,000 cash around these islands within weeks of Kiribati's recognition of Beijing. What sort of democratic country spies on journalists and puts them under house arrest? Yeah. We're embarrassed to be part of that, you know. So you'd be happy to come to our aid? Sure, sure. If we get chucked yeah, in there? Yeah. So, well, at least there's a little bit of democracy left on Kiribati. <laughs> Count, Countess says your friends, you know, I, I don't think, you know, we'll, we'll ever you know, forgive these guys you know, for what doing. What do they do you and, and what do they put Kiribati's map, Kiribati's on the map? Mm. It's, it's a sad day. Sad day for democracy. Perhaps safeguarded by the presence of these two men, we were merely deported from Kiribati back to the Solomon Islands the following day. Why do you think the Kiribati government is so paranoid about media crews telling the story of what's going on there? Well, I think it's pretty clear that there's something to do with the kinds of money that's being brought in. How that money's being distributed uh, obviously would be something that they would probably not want people to know about or hear about. And on the very day we arrive back in the Solomons, an immense deal is announced for Chinese control of the country's only gold mine, high above Honiara. This is the Gold Ridge Mine. It's an old gold mine that's been resurrected in the first major deal the Solomon Islands has done with China since it switched allegiances to the communist country. Incredibly, China describes the $825 million purchase and all the infrastructure it intends to build here as an early harvest. And if you need evidence of advanced Chinese planning, we're told by a mine insider that the security guard's uniforms complete with communist China's flag, were ordered six months ago, even though the diplomatic recognition that opened the way to this deal was only two months ago. 
the Chinese will not only reap the direct profits from this gold mine, but everything they build to service it, roads, railways and port facilities, will remain in China's hands forever. But just across the water, there's potentially an even more glittering prize. Coming up, that is truly enormous. 60 billion reasons. One of the biggest man-made pits in the world. The Chinese want this piece of Bougainville. China is now taking control of the South Pacific. And why Australia is the big loser. Australia is making enemy out of Bougainville. That's next on 60 Minutes. On our tour of the Pacific, we'd find conclusive proof of China's long-term planning for our region. We're in Bougainville, still part of Papua New Guinea, but not for long. Next week, it votes in a referendum on its independence. Bougainville was one of the forgotten campaigns of World War II, but 516 Australians died here during the war. 516. Put that in context for me. Well, that's comparable to Vietnam. But veteran journalist Ben Bohane covered a far bloodier conflict here. The Bougainville Civil War, where a rebel army fought New Guinea for independence and control of the fabulously wealthy Panguna gold mine. Over 10,000 people died between 1988 and 1998. Uh, given the small population here, safe to say virtually every single family would have been affected one way or the other. In small places like this, every family was touched by the war. One of the commanders of the Bougainville rebel army was General Sam Kauna. Uh, politicians, they, they make war and we fight the war. Now, Ben Bohane and I are headed to meet the general at his headquarters in the south of Bougainville's main island. It's hard to imagine fighting a war in this terrain. Harder still to imagine the infrastructure required to bring this place into the 21st century once it achieves independence. But if it does, General Kauna is one of the leading contenders to become its first president, supported by his formidable wife, Josie. General, how confident are you that Bougainville will become independent? I am sure. I've seen it. I've, I've, I've gone around the island, north to south, um, seen and heard people expressing their uh, feelings, their views. You've been campaigning relentlessly, haven't you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. To make sure they, that, that, that they vote for independence. But central to any hope Bougainville has of becoming a self-sustaining nation lies deep inland, its golden heart, the mine called Panguna. Ben Bohane and I are being given rare access to this legendary place. Have a look at that. That is truly enormous. One of the biggest man-made pits in the world. It's estimated Panguna still holds nearly $60 billion worth of gold and copper. So that's what the war was all about. And the future here too, I guess. Yeah. This is the mine that triggered the war and may well be key to the future of Bougainville. It's an eerie place, a frozen moment of the aftermath of war. So, so it's in here. So it's in here. We meet the Panguna rebel commander, Moses Papiro, who shows us the massive safe where the mine's gold was once stored. Now welded shut, it contains the weapons his men laid down for peace. How many weapons? Uh, maybe 200 plus. But if Bougainville is denied its independence by Papua New Guinea, which has to ratify the referendum vote, Moses has a somber warning. Moses, is there any way in which those weapons would be used again? Wait to see. <laughs> Maybe war is coming again, or we don't know. In truth, it's unthinkable that war will revisit this devastated place. But restoring it to production seems almost equally impossible. This mine 
is set to be the beating heart of the new Bougainville Republic, and the blood pumping through it is destined to be foreign sourced. The big question is, will China win this too? Bougainville now is starting on a clean slate. Uh, we will be looking at um, all avenues. What about China? China inclusive, yes. Uh, China is uh, the superpower uh, in the world. We are free, Bougainville is free to be choosing whichever uh, countries uh, that we can have the best deal with. On the eve of the independence vote, an extraordinary revelation by General Kauna. A detailed plan for the complete infrastructure rebuild of the island. And the plan is Chinese. The first over has come from China, it is here with us. We are still waiting for um, Australian offer, uh, USA offer, uh, of how they could support Bougainville. Roads, ports and airport, all to be built by China. But the general is adamant it's only because Australia and the US have offered nothing of the sort. Australia even refused the general a visa, an almost unforgivable insult. You're saying if Australia is truly genuine, you want an apology and you want us to do more now. That, that, that's why I feel um, Australia is making an enemy out of Sam. Australia is making enemy out of Bougainville when they give me the treatment. Observing this with us is Captain Jim Fennell, the former intelligence commander of the US Pacific Fleet, who's been with us on this trip. There's been no previous inkling that China has such a long-term master plan for Bougainville. And as our last stop, it's alarming news for this experienced China watcher. If Bougainville becomes the world's newest country, that's quite a prize for China, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it sets up what, with the, the flip at Kiribati and the flip in the Solomons, and what they're doing in Vanuatu, what they're doing in Fiji, you, you start to see a trend line here, which is that China is now taking control of the South Pacific. And so I think that's why you're starting to see some change in, a, in the United States, for instance, and even in your own government in Australia, where people are starting to say, if we don't stand up and check China's expansionism, we will be ruled by them in another 25 or 30 years. Hello, I'm Liam Bartlett. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.